Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today and thanks for waiting for the past couple of minutes. Uh, as everybody knows, um, in this time, there's a lot of technical issues uh, that can crop up. So that was exactly what happened earlier. Um, but thank you for being understanding. And uh, yeah, we are super excited to start the session. So um, thanks for joining us on a Tuesday evening. I'm Jiaxing from the Google Developer Relations team. And this is Ivan from Data Science Singapore. Um, before we begin today's session, let me briefly introduce what Google Developer Space is and what we do. So um, we are a platform for developers and startups from around the region to learn and connect with one another. And we have a physical space in the Google Singapore office, but I think we haven't had a physical event since, uh, I think, more than a year now. Um, yeah, but hope everybody is keeping safe and well uh, and tuning in from the comforts of your own home. Uh, yeah, and we regularly host uh, events with developers and startup communities. So uh, do subscribe to our channel to keep updated with all the events that are coming up. Uh, yeah, with that, I'll hand off to Ivan to share more about today's session. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, sorry, apologies for the delay. Uh, so for today, we actually have a couple of speakers from Capgemini. So to kick off the session, we have um, Frank, uh, who's the Managing Director of the Head APEC uh, Insights and Data, AI, and Dr. Jing Yan Zhao, uh, the VP of the de department. So their teams actually focus on developing and developing uh, and delivering large scale end-to-end uh, -end AI solutions in real life. So um, they actually have two parts. For the first use case, uh, they will be actually sharing on document classification and processing using OCR and computer vision methods. Uh, so some of the work they, they're doing actually involves helping the public sector to do some uh, document classification. So for the next use case, um, they are actually using an AI-powered smart interior design platform and using image uh, recognition technology and deep learning algorithms to optimize and analyze sorry, uh, customers' preferences in design, color, texture, products, and enable designers and AI to work together. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Frank, the managing director of the team, as well as uh, Dr. Jingyan Zhao to do the introduction for their team. Frank, please. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Ivan. And um, we'll, we'll start off with a, a bit of an introduction about who we are at Capgemini um, and, and who the, the speakers will be. So, so as Ivan's already introduced myself and Jing Wong, um, we'll bring to you uh, Richard Price from our Australia business uh, to speak around the document classification piece uh, and Eve from our China practice to, to speak uh, around the, um, the the augmented AI piece uh, with visualization. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, and let me just introduce first off uh, Cap Capgemini. Uh, and if we do next slide, we'll, we'll sort of give a picture as to where we are within the region. So we, we are a large scale provider. M many would sort of know the brand throughout the region. We have over 270,000 people around the world. Um, and for, for our practice in insights and data, uh, I, I like to say we get to do some of the most exciting things. Um, we, we drive the AI initiatives and, and of course, behind the AI, we drive the data platform and data engineering initiatives, which, which of course is, is where the most intelligent AI comes from. So, so for us, this is a really exciting play um, and we're proud to be part of a very large scale organization. Uh, that can really help the uh, the environment not just do one or two use cases, but to do data science and AI at scale. So if we go, go to the next slide. The, the other thing that's very important to know about Capgemini is that we pride ourselves both on uh, purpose as well as our values. We've been uh, a company for over 53 years. Um, and at the beginning of our journey, we really sort of established a set of values and while we're a community of practitioners around the world and we work across um, all the countries in Asia Pac, um, we're held together by our purpose and, and by our values. So it's important uh, to, to sort of see what brings us together in the far reaches uh, of, of the region that we work in. We're also very, uh, uh, very prideful in regards to what we're actually doing for not only our clients, but for our people. 
And we, we have uh, our brand promise, which is get the future you want. And, and for us, this is really meaningful because we're not just out there doing wonderful things for our clients, but we recognize that each one of our employees has a unique journey and a journey that is really powerful for them to develop their skills um, and enhance their, their maturity in the market. And, and to be honest, we, we get to do some of the most exciting work for our clients. Um, clients tend not to hire uh, consultants like ourselves unless they're doing really challenging work. So we do get to give our people some of the most, um, most exciting parts uh, of the AI industry at their disposal to, to learn and develop skills. Um, we're also very proud of the research that we do. So we don't just consult and do projects. We also um, spend an awful lot of time researching the market. And this just shows an example of the publications. So many of the, the use cases you'll hear about today, they are part of what actually feeds our broader research in the market um, and publications, which give uh, sort of a real consolidated collection uh, of view. Um, next slide. So this just gives a, a, a sort of region as to where we are around the world. Um, I'll do this quite quickly. So let's go to the next slide. Um, th this of course is where we are in Asia Pacific. So of the 270,000 people, um, if we sort of drill right down to the right hand side of this slide, we, we have just under 1800 people in Asia Pacific um, that are doing this type of exciting AI and data work. And you see across all the different uh, countries and regions within uh, Asia Pacific. So, so not only uh, a wonderful array of AI technologies, but, but also a wonderful array of cultural differences and uh, different ways of doing business across the region. So, so quite exciting for, for us. Um, and, and maybe just sort of a, a bit more. I mean, yes, we will talk about some very exciting use cases in the AI space. But we know very well that AI use cases are one part of the puzzle. They need to sit within businesses where those businesses actually deliver value to their consumers, their customers. We, we realize that our customers need to um, focus on the trust issues and the ethics issues around our AI routines. That They recognize they can't do these things by themselves, so they have to leverage partner ecosystem. We pride ourselves as a very large player in the market to be a strong supporter of the startup community and a strong supporter of incubation of companies that are going through their journey where innovation is at the core of what they do, whether it's in academia, whether it's in startups. Um, we, we really push our laboratories to assist this part of the market. So for us, it's not just about building really cool AI use cases, although that is a lot of fun. Um, it's very much about having an end-to-end -end capability for our clients that we can bring to market. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave you with uh, Jing Wang to uh, talk specifically about our Performai capability. Jing Wang, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Uh, hello, everyone. So in the uh, this session, I will briefly uh, share with you our uh, AI capability, our uh, AI portfolio, and uh, uh, some uh, uh, capabilities that we are building now. So firstly, I want to share uh, one research report by Capgemini uh, Research Institute uh, in last year, June. So. Uh, as a uh, data professionals, right, we know in the organization, uh, a lot of organizations have set up the data and uh, uh, AI or data science uh, uh, teams. However, um, some of organizations have uh, done a lot of uh, uh, POC, but uh, they didn't put in production. So uh, some uh, uh, data science team or some uh, CIO uh, may be facing some challenges uh, about uh, how to explain the ROI of uh, uh, investment, right? So we spend a lot of money to build a data lake, data warehouse, and then we hire a big of a big team of uh, data scientists. But how to bring the uh, business impact to the organization? This one, uh, based on this uh, this uh, question, we do a lot of uh, uh, surveys and interviews with the uh, organization globally, and then we found the uh, uh, left hand side you see uh, we do the comparison for 2017 and 2020. So you see the blue color, right? This means uh, the organization is uh, uh, 
doing the AI SKU means uh, not only the POC, also they put the AI solution in production to supporting the business operation. And the red color means uh, the organization only do the AI uh, pilot or POC. So we see in 2017, uh, uh, right? So we have 64% of organization is only doing the POC stage. And moving to 2020, we see this, uh, uh, this uh, percentage, uh, uh, large scale deployment of uh, AI increased to uh, half half. So uh, means uh, now more and more organizations realize we need to put AI in uh, big scale deployment instead of just a POC or doing some uh, fancy uh, uh, algorithm. However, let's see the right hand side. Uh, we also found only 13% of organization is a really skilled AI throughout multiple teams. So maybe for some organizations, right, the uh, uh, blue color, they do the production, uh, productionize the AI models by just uh, for one or two uh, business uh, uh, unit. For example, they do the marketing uh, uh, solutions. Maybe they do some uh, uh, supply chain solutions, but it's not uh, uh, across the organization. So now uh, the next uh, question is uh, how we bring our organization to the large scale deployment. So this is uh, uh, something uh, Capgemini Perform AI portfolio is uh, focused on to not build the fancy uh, AI solution, but also to deliver the business outcome with speed and skill. So we want to bring uh, our client from uh, exploration development to the large scale deployment. So to uh, achieve this uh, large scale deployment, we need to uh, uh, build a uh, uh, solid data foundation and AI platform. Also, we need to have the uh, team of uh, rescue site. Also, we need uh, uh, we need to have the right uh, uh, organization structure to support the development and the deployment. Uh, also. After we uh, uh, go live the AI models, we also need a, a, a system to monitor and then enhance the AI solution. So we call this a four element at the right hand side to enable the scaling AI. And uh, when we uh, define the AI in Capgemini, right, it's not only uh, for the data, for the algorithm. We also include the uh, intelligent application, intelligent automation to make sure this uh, AI uh, solution is end to end uh, to embed in the uh, business operation. Also, we also have the business model innovation how to see how we use data and AI to reinvent the business model. And uh, globally for uh, AI uh, domain, we have uh, 55K professionals uh, uh, across the uh, multiple countries. And uh, we also have a team now including the data engineering, data uh, scientists, machine learning engineering. We also include the UI, UX design, and also have the automation specialists. So uh, to build the uh, AI capabilities, we set up uh, AI COEs across the globe. So now we are setting up uh, nine AI COEs, including the APEC one. And this is uh, how we build our AI capabilities. Let's see the bottom first. So the bottom uh, is uh, five blocks we are building now. The left hand side is uh, more on the AI strategy. So for some organizations, they just started their AI journey. Uh, so they may not have a clear view on their how to use data and AI and what's the AI strategy, what's the uh, roadmap. So our uh, Capgemini consulting uh, arm will provide this uh, AI strategy consulting services also to provide some uh, uh, consulting services to help organization to uh, uh, do the uh, innovation and uh, uh, reinvent their business model. And after the organization have a clear view on the AI, then we will go to the right hand side. The right hand side is about the uh, building, about the development and deployment. So the bottom one is the foundation. So without a, a strong data foundation, we couldn't do any data science and AI. So the uh, foundation layer will be a data engineering and the AI platform. So we build the technology, we uh, uh, implement the tools, and also to set up the trusted uh, data and AI. 
So after we have this uh, foundation, we are going to the uh, this uh, two one. These two are uh, application and solution. One is about how to use the uh, analytics data science and AI to uh, de uh, develop the uh, models and the solutions. And the right hand side is about the uh, IPA is about uh, uh, how to automate the uh, uh, business uh, process. So combined together, we are aiming to deliver end-to-end uh, -end, uh, solutions to our clients. And some uh, uh, some of you may may ask the question is uh, then uh, how you design the solutions, right? For example, uh, customer chain prediction. This is a very common problem for multiple sectors. Whether we are just uh, develop a generic model, no. So we are building the model is uh, based on the sector, based on the business domain. So you see the upper one, right? We will focus on the three uh, play field. Uh, is a customer first. This one is a uh, focus on the marketing, the customer service, the sales, right? And then we also have the intelligent industry is uh, more for the uh, uh, for the uh, manufacturing, uh, how we use AI to increase the uh, operation, and also how to cover the uh, supply chain optimization. And uh, moving to uh, enterprise management, we also have a lot of uh, risk management uh, compliance and also the productivity uh, improvement. And definitely the last one uh, is uh, how to uh, leverage the data partners to reinvent uh, the business model. And for each sector, we have the uh, sector leaders to uh, lead us to provide the sector-driven uh, AI solutions for CPRD, for public sector, manufacturing, telco, utility, and financial services. So this is the... Uh, Capture Night Perform AI Setup. Uh, besides our internal uh, Capture Night internal uh, data professionals and uh, capabilities, we also leverage the uh, global ecosystem to apply innovation exchange network we call AIE. So for by today, we have uh, set up uh, 20 plus uh, AIE centers already. In APEC, we have Singapore, we have Australia, uh, India, Shenzhen, all these uh, centers. So through the AIE network, we are talking to the uh, global uh, AI startup, AI uh, technology partners to bring the new technology uh, to our client to do the innovation and the R&D. And today, uh, for the AI, right, we are setting up the AI COE by domains. For example, we fo uh, we have some COEs uh, focusing on the computer vision, have some COEs focus on the speech and NLP, and also how uh, 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 AI COEs focusing on the deep learning, machine learning uh, algorithm build, uh, uh, build up. Uh, today, uh, we will uh, walk you through some uh, uh, computer vision capability and applications. So in Capture Minai, uh, we have uh, different uh, sectors, we have different applications. So for the computer vision, the common one we know, right, is uh, facial recognition. Also can apply into some uh, customer analytics, for example, to understand the customer emotion, to uh, provide some uh, product recommendation and understand some uh, sentiment. But we also utilize the uh, apply the uh, computer vision in the different domains, for example, in the uh, oil and gas, in the manufacturing. So the first uh, image you see, right, is a uh, uh, hardware plus a uh, uh, software uh, application. We are using drone to uh, capture the image and video for the uh, oil and gas uh, companies. And uh, to uh, also the backend, we build the uh, CNN algorithm to identify the uh, broken insulators. So this one will help this uh, uh, client to do the predictive maintenance instead of uh, uh, the insulator uh, have some uh, downtime or some uh, uh, to, uh, to have some uh, uh, delays. And the middle one is uh, also we apply this uh, uh, computer vision in a manufacturing uh, 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 business scenario. So we want to identify some uh, uh, default uh, defect to do the quality, uh, quality assurance. So for this one, we put the camera 
to uh, capture the uh, images. And then we use the deep learning algorithm to identify the painting damage and the location. And uh, if we identify this uh, damage, we will remove the, uh, the product immediately using the robotics. So this one is another example of end-to-end uh, -end solutions, how to use a uh, computer vision in the, uh, uh, in the manufacturing. And the right-hand side, this one, this one is uh, to uh, uh, identify whether the worker wearing the safety helmet and safety uh, jacket. So this one is uh, also is an uh, application to make sure the safety. And the bottom two cases, one is the smart trolley. When we're going to the supermarket, uh, the biggest uh, uh, challenge we are facing is uh, is a long queue, right? The customer long queue. So then, how to do the uh, the uh, automate uh, checkout? This one is uh, some innovation we are doing now. So we are combining the barcode reader and also the image. Uh, uh, the computer vision technology to identify the SKU immediately and help the client do the self uh, checkout instead of uh, queuing. And the right hand side is also use a computer vision to understand the uh, retailer supermarket shelf. So this one will help the brand and uh, help the store manager to understand the brand performance and the product performance. Also, we can do the competitor analysis. Also, this one will capture uh, some uh, uh, common challenges in the uh, supermarket. For example, auto stock, right? Uh, when we identify the auto stock, then the store manager can arrange some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, restock uh, activities. So these are some uh, uh, examples we are doing the uh, computer vision application for our client. But definitely in today's session, we will have uh, Dr. Uh, Richard and Eve to share uh, two cases in details. The first one is uh, how to use OCR and uh, uh, computer vision to the document classification and processing. And the other one is about the, uh, for the designer uh, domain. So now I pass to Richard to cover the first uh, case study. Richard? Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Richard Price. I have the pleasure of being the head of AI analytics and data science for Capgemini Insights and Data uh, in Australia. And uh, what we're going to be uh, now is uh, about some computer vision work we've been doing for one of our government clients um, in, in, in the area of document processing. Um, so, um, uh, JY, if you wouldn't mind going to the first slide? Yes. Thank you. Um, so, many governments, as I'm sure people are aware, many, gov many government and commercial organisations require customers to upload documents uh, in support of the organization's business processes. That may be uh, a customer making an application for something, making a claim, providing a proof of their identity or a proof of payment. I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, with having to do this from time to time. And so these documents are typically scanned um, uh, into computers and then um, forwarded to the organizations or they're uploaded as photographs. Either way, that causes the receiving organization to have to process uh, an image. And these documents are therefore, <coughs> excuse me, are therefore images or commonly known as image documents, um, which is fine if humans are going to look at these documents as long as the document quality is OK. But humans are generally OK at reading a document upside, upside down or we can push a button to rotate the document and, and, and visualize it or, or, or look at a document if it's been skewed or if the, uh, if the image is uh, noisy or blurry. But um, it, that, that situation poses a lot more problems if we want to automate that process um, by, by, with, with computers. And therefore, the problem becomes a computer vision problem. I'm just moving on. Um, uh, hi, Richard. Um, form that we're, we're all probably used to. Hi, JY. Yeah. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just forwarding on to the, ne the next slide. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, so this, 
This is an example of a typical document seen in government or commercial organizations. You'll see that we have regions on the page that are quite identifiable. We'll have signature blocks, uh, say typically on the, on the left-hand document. On the right-hand document, we have lots of text boxes. These are boxes where custom, the customers fill in their specific customer, informa customer information. Within this field of document processing, these fields are known as entities. And if we want to automate this process, we, we need to be able to identify the location of these text boxes and then extract the core information from them. Um, but th these documents here, I mean, they're what we would say would be pretty good quality. The document on the left hand side has some uh, some typical complexities. You've got a, a, thing, a finger blocking or possibly a thumb. Um, uh, in, in the middle of the document, you've got a bit of a shadow on the bottom left. Um, you can see some that it's the, because the document is being held up or the page is being held up, it, it's kind of warped a little bit, all of which um, offers complications when you're trying to read this document um, automatically. Uh, next slide, JY. Um, so I want to initially focus on the task of document classification. So if we imagine we've got documents coming to the, into the system on the left hand side, we want to be able to run a, um, some computer vision software that can automatically identify the classification of the document. So here we've got some potentially a medical certificate, we might have a rent certificate, we might have a bank statement. These could be all documents that the system knows about. But of course, there are many, many more documents that could exist in the world that the system won't know about. And we want to be able to classify those as uh, unknown documents. Um, and so it itself is, is, a, is, a, is a document class, class itself. Um, so um, we'll be uh, focusing just on this problem of document classification because often organizations such as our client um, they want to route um, the documents to certain individuals who are skilled at processing those kind of documents um, within within their system. And if that if a document is misclassified and routed to the wrong person, it it confuses the system with the, the um, and it and it adds um, complexities and inefficiencies because. The person that does receive that document incorrectly has got to put it back into the queue and then that document is going to go back to the bottom of the queue causing that customer's case to be delayed in processing uh, next slide um, and so as i explained earlier really this um, the, once we've identified the classification of a document we may want to do all sorts of things clever things such as extract key information out of out of the form so say for example we've got an insurance claim form we might want to be able to uh, from that claim form extract the type of, in, of uh, claim being claimed for so in this case maybe a motor vehicle and we want to be able to extract a particular field such as repair cost as i mentioned earlier that's known as entity extraction and typically in the field, although this is we are capable of doing this and we have this working, but this is for probably another another talk. Um, but the that process relies on us, first of all, correctly classifying the document. And then once we know what type of document it is, we look to um, extract the key entities, the entities of interest, the typically text boxes of interest. Um, and then we want to either OCR or ICR, and I, uh, obviously OCR optical character recognition and ICR intelligent character recognition, and this is essentially handwriting to text to extract the important information from the entities. But as I say, entity extraction is is one for an, another presentation. So on to the next slide. Um, what I want to talk about is a technique which we've found to be um, pretty successful, which we conceived for this project, and it's called the object, object detection doc, document classification method. But uh, before I get into that, I first of all want to explain what object detection is all about. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, will be aware of it, but um, 
the definition of object detection from Wikipedia is it's a computer technology, technology related to computer vision and, and image processing that deals with detecting instances of semantic objects of a certain class, such as humans, buildings or cars. So on the left, we've got a, a street scene of probably, I would say, London, judging by the, the big red bus. And we can see these boxes have been placed around uh, the, the people and the vehicles um, <clears throat> uh, that, that are in the scene. Um, <clears throat> on the right hand side, we have some computers, we have chairs, we have people, all with back boxes being placed around them. And then, this is what object detection software does. It, it places a bounding box around the region within the image where it believes uh, an object exists that, or an object that the object detection system knows about and it will give you the, the top left coordinate of the, um, of the boundary box in the bottom right um, and it will give you the, 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 the semantic name for the object that it thinks it's found, person, vehicle, whatever, um, and it will give you a confidence score of how confident um, the object detection uh, machine learning algorithm is in its detection of that object. Um, now, there are commonly used open source platforms that, uh, like uh, a lot of things these days, we don't have to do these things from scratch, uh, which many years ago we, we used to have to, but now um, things are made a lot easier and kindly people like Facebook Research um, and others have um, provided open source libraries to allow us to um, connect into um, object, object detection capabilities um, and use them in our applications. Some of those, some example frameworks that are available, there's Detectron 2, that should read Detectron 2 uh, from Facebook research. There's YOLO version 5, I think YOLO stands for You Only Look Once, and um, Fast AI. So these are different uh, Python-based libraries that we can utilize. Um, we, for this project, used Detectron 2 from Facebook AI researchers uh, research group, um, which, as I say, is, uh, is open source. Um, it, like most of these packages or capabilities, it builds um, on um, transfer learning um, to build upon existing pre-trained image, rec image recognition models. The one that uh, is, uh, well, I think uh, you can access various ones from Detectron 2, one of which is um, ResNet uh, 34. Um, so ResNet 34 is, again, publicly available. It's a 34-layer, i.e. Deep, le deep learning, um, layered residual convolution neural, neural network that has been pre-trained on um, 100,000 plus images from a image database called ImageNet, and it's been pre-trained on 200 different classes, different objects that are seen in the common world. And transfer learning, for those who aren't aware, is where we take one of these pre-existing trained models, so the, 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 the deep learning neural network has all the weights and the weight values um, trained, and we then top up the training of that network to make it um, basically be able to detect the objects of interest for our particular application. In our case, there are regions of interest in our client documents. Um, and the way I sort of think of this is that the ResNet 34 comes pre-trained and allows you to be able, and, and it can see and what we're doing with this um, transfer learning is enabling it to see the things that are of interest to our particular problem. So uh, if we just move on to the next slide, um, this uh, is now getting on to explaining how the object detection based document classification system works. Um, we, do, um, we, we do this by the process of selecting four anchors on a document. These are four regions on a document which we typically choose to be um, just, if you like, the form-related information and won't, that doesn't contain any customer information. Um, because if, we, if a customer is adding information in, it's going to add noise. What we want to do is find these four regions, which we call anchors, and on the, um, the document image uh, on the right there, um, there, are five, there are four 
anchors identified. There's one actually is which consists of the words rent certificate. Um, of course, those are just pixels to the, from an image perspective, not the actual words. There's a big box with U just beneath it. Um, across to the right, there's a box with some text in it. And down to the bottom left, there's another box with some smaller boxes and text in it. Um, these are what we call anchors. And what we do is we, using an open source labeling tool, and we use one called Label Studio, which people may or may not be familiar with. There's a, an image of Label Studio down on the, the bottom right of the slide there. And so what we do is we literally label up in this tool, and the tool allows you to uh, grab the particular region you're interested in, and we'll say maybe that piece of the document is just a rent certificate, we will say that's anchor number one. Um, maybe the, the, the U box just underneath it is anchor number two. The box to the right may be anchor number three, and the box bottom below is anchor number four. So we label 200 documents of each document type. So they may be rent certificates, we'll, la we'll label 200 of those. We'll label 200 meds medical certificates, 200 Commonwealth bank statements, etc. However many classes, we, this initial um, build of the model, we, we focused on 10 classes, 10 document types. And so um, then what we do, so once the, once the, um, the documents have been labelled, we then train Detectron 2 through transfer learning to learn these four anchors of all our documents. So um, interestingly, what we've done is we've used a concept or a concept which we've termed label overloading. So for, if you like, for say this document, a rent certificate, anchor one may be those, that area which has rent certificate identified. But for a medical certificate, anchor number one, may be a, quite a different visually looking region of, of say, a med certificate. But the to the Detectron model, these are just other instances of what we're going to call anchor one. And so we've overloaded the, that anchor one with all of the different anchor ones from our different document types. But the um, the, the object detection software is perfectly capable of, of handling this um, this situation. And so once we've trained the model to be able to correctly recognize the four anchors of interest for our documents, we, um, we, we can then run the object detection across, our, across those 200 documents. And we can then um, uh, train a model to, um, to sorry, if, if JY, if you mind just going on to the next slide, we can train a model which is based upon the, the distant, the Euclidean distances that the Detectron software, uh, well, we, we, from the Detectron software, we identify the centroids, the centers of all of the four anchors from which we can calculate the Euclidean distances between each of our anchors. So we can calculate the, the Euclidean difference, difference distance between anchor one and anchor two, anchor one and anchor three, anchor one and anchor four, anchor two and anchor three, um, anchor two and anchor four, and anchor three and anchor four. So all combinations of those distances can be calculated. And what we essentially do, so I've, I've, on this slide, I've given the, I'm sure people will be familiar with the, uh, the calculation for Euclidean distance, but the Euclidean distance between two points, x1, y1, x2, y2, is given by that expression there. And from that, from these Euclidean distances, we can basically feed in 200 examples to a second model of these distances and we say well these distances are the distances that are associated with say a rent certificate these distances are associated with a medical certificate etc etc and so we use the detectron 2 software to to detect the presence of the anchors we once we've detect the presence of the anchors we calculate 
the combinations of those Euclidean distances and in fact the confidence scores produced by Detectron 2 and they go into a, our final decision-making classifier um, which is a straightforward Gaussian um, a, a, a Gaussian mixture, uh, sorry, Gaussian, Gaussian, um, Gaussian, uh, um, a, 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 a Gaussian based method from SK Learn, um, gradient boosting method, thank you, pardon, uh, from, from SK Learn. So, um, that is that's a straightforward classifier and, um, doesn't take much training at all, trains up in seconds. And so, um, uh, I'll present the initial results we had on um, 1,010 randomly selected uh, documents in our test set, um, from, uh, which were selected from 10 separate classes. So approximately 100 documents in each of each uh, test, test class, and they were randomly se selected from our production database. So they these had all the uh, the standard errors and um, and uh, complications that our customers can uh, can throw at us, and uh, so on the table to the right we have the precision scores for each of the uh, ten classes, the recall scores and the F1 scores, um, and we can therefore of course calculate the the uh, the mean accuracies, precision and recall across all of the ten scores. And as you can see, it's highly reliable against that test data set. It's 90, it's proven to be 98% accurate. And um, so, and, and this, these metrics have, have held up when they've been the, uh, when we've thrown many more test documents at, uh, at this system. So um, you may think, well, you've only presented results for 10 document types, but our uh, where in the real world, we're probably going to have to deal with a lot more than that, and that is quite true. And so, um, if we want to add another document type into the system, we basically have to source 200 documents of that type of document and, and label the four anchors uh, using Label Studio. And it takes about a day to source and label 200 documents, we found. and then we've got to uh, retrain um, our ResNet 34 um, object detection um, algorithm. And that is that typically takes uh, at least overnight. We typically send, set it running before we leave uh, uh, at night and it'll be trained in the morning and then we want to do some final checks. And so it's basically a two day turnaround we find to add a new document type. We're, we're currently trying some interesting ideas using the concept of image augmentation, which these are, this is software that allows you to blur, rotate, uh, basically um, add all sorts of forms of noise to a document. And if we can, um, we could possibly uh, train our documents on these uh, sort of synthet synthetically created noisy documents and possibly do away without the need to have to label the 200 documents. Um, so the business benefits that this uh, can offer, as I was saying earlier, um, if now our, our client organization can have 98% of their documents, um, of, of their client documents uh, being um, directed to the appropriate person, this will add significant speed um, and, and efficiencies to to their business processes. Um, they currently have um, uh, a whole team of 40 staff whose sole job it is to, to perform this document classification task manually, which could, uh, which could all be up, um, man, uh, this could all be performed uh, in an automatic fashion. Um, and so that not only speeds up our clients' business processes, it will also improve the customer experience for for our clients. Uh, just moving on, JY. Um, now, some of the technical problems and learnings, um, as one might expect, because we've trained the model on real-world documents taken randomly from uh, from our, our, our image our document database, um, it's inherently 
been uh, trained to, to to deal with the the noise of, uh, that our clients throw at us in, um, in with their real documents. You know, documents that are rotated uh, upside down, um, have, are pixelated, uh, maybe warped. Or all of the training documents have got these uh, issues within them, and so. Um, the system sort of inherently learns to be able to deal with these complexities. Um, one little thing that I didn't mention when I was talking about the Euclidean distances is we always, we normalize our Euclidean distances relative to the, the Euclidean distance between anchor one and anchor two. And so we divide all our distances by that fixed amount. And that trick enables the system to be scale invariant. So if a, if a customer is taking a photograph of a document from maybe 30 centimetres away or 60 centimetres away, they, that, would, that shouldn't matter because the object detection software will feel, still find those objects within the images and the relative distances will still will, will be unchanged by the scale change um, introduced by, by the photograph uh, being taken at different um, heights. And so the system is, again, inherently scale invariant. Um, tricks, we found that um, object detection doesn't tends not to work very well for very small regions, and interestingly also for very large regions. Um, and so you've kind of got to just find that sweet spot, which is around that 30 to 40 center sort of millimeters um, kind of uh, height and width. I mean, you can go obviously, uh, you know, within a, a, an order of two or, 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 you know, one and a half times that kind of, of, uh, uh, of shape. But um, we found that tends to be the sweet spot. Um, and the other trick we found is that this uh, trick of overloading our, um, our anchors. And so finally, moving on to the conclusion slide, um, as I just mentioned, the object detection-based document classification system has been to hand, has been designed to handle the complexities faced uh, when classifying real-world production documents because it's been trained on uh, the very same. Um, uh, the system has proven itself in, uh, in in more extensive testing and is currently being integrated into our client's production system. Um, it's been developed in a containerized fashion and therefore can be relatively straightforward, uh, lifted and shifted and transported into another client, another, uh, another document uh, domain. And uh, we, of course, we, it would need labeling and training for your particular documents, but um, uh, you know, it, it should relatively uh, seamlessly um, be capable of being of, of moving into a totally different environment, and you know we 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 know and hear about um, multiple applications for this technology across a broad range of uh, of industry sectors, and uh, we'd be very keen to uh, to discuss any potential application with any interested parties. Okay, JY, that uh, that concludes my presentation. Yes, thank you, Richard. It's a very very impressive sharing. Uh, okay, now we pass to uh, Eve to uh, go us uh, uh, some uh, uh, sharing about uh, the uh, uh, design platform using the image processing. Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. And it's nice to so, uh, see so many of you and thank for coming today. And uh, just uh, uh, roughly about myself, I'm Eve and head of the data science at China. And uh, I specialize in machine learning, deep learning model, and led dozens of the data science projects for the world leading company, including uh, BMW and uh, Daimler and so on. And in this talk, I want to guide you through the work that uh, we have done last year for our clients how to use the uh, image uh, process and computer vision deep learning algorithm to interact with uh, consumer uh, preference in color design product and enable designer and AI to work together. So uh, uh, about the agendas, uh, we will divide in uh, three parts. 
the first is I I would like to give you let's say uh, kinds of general overview uh, of business background, and uh, after that I will talk about the challenge and present the work done with the Capgemini and our team members that actually uh, deliver the computer uh, vision model for our clients and empower, empower designer in China. And last part, I will talk about uh, what's the next step to conclude. So the next page, please. So uh, at the beginning, uh, our request is uh, design an AI solution for a very big furniture company. And as we may note, uh, designer in the industry, they have a lot of design uh, work to do. Uh, such like the poster or they need to uh, uh, design the website. And in order to uh, attract the consumer's eyeballs, so I think the task is very heavy and consume a lot of time in their daily work. So they, they, they eager to have an uh, AI assistant to help them design the dominant color, secondary colors, and boost the quality of the idea generation uh, process. And moreover, another pain point is for the consumer side, uh, in the past, they just sell their uh, product and put the item on the shelf. But right now, they would like to improve the interactions with the end user and increase the customer experience uh, in their purchase process on the website by uh, using our AI solutions. So nowadays, AI can help to achieve these two goals. So in this, uh, in this uh, last page, JY, move to the, uh, the last pa previous page, JY, yeah. So uh, in, this, uh, in this page, we uh, just sum up the, uh, the backgrounds. And in general, based on uh, we have already a clear goal, just like I mentioned. So we want to help our client to deal with the pain points by our AI solution, uh, including uh, serve the consumer and designers. So our goal is uh, how we use the deep learning algorithm to analyze uh, customer preference for the uh, color design and how AI can boost or improve the quality of the idea generation uh, process for the designer. So uh, you can see in this page uh, at the right, uh, at the uh, left hand side, uh, based on the background, we propose the module for our clients, uh, which include the color uh, analyst uh, uh, model and tagging model and uh, AI scoring model. In generally, uh, first colors model is help to analyze the color from the uh, picture for the designer. And the tagging model is identified the object of the image. For example, they can identify the, the table or the chairs of the image. And finally, is uh, AI scoring is how we evaluate uh, the image quality and uh, uh, which means we can use the AI model to uh, say the picture is beautiful or not. So uh, we already know the background, so move to the, uh, the feature design. So uh, this is our uh, feature design and we built three models. Uh, just I uh, mentioned uh, color tagging and scoring model, you can see uh, on the left. And we also provide the API service for further deployment for our clients. And so uh, in, uh, in the scope, uh, the blue part is the uh, list scope of the, this POC. So the next page. So uh, before we enter to the model detail, uh, I think we can see our demo video to give you a clear image in your mind at the first. So this is the front page. And if after the, uh, the client or consumer, they can choose the image to upload uh, uh, different kinds of image to our portal. 
and then uh, you can see the buttons size level change and extract the main color secondary color and the accent color uh, from the button side and uh, right uh, the right side is about uh, the image uh, uh, up, uh, class classifications and what's the score we we, we think about this build uh, this image. So this is uh, about our our video demo. So uh, after after our our demo, you may have a uh, big pictures. Uh, and uh, an image in your mind. And so you may be very curious how we did that, uh, this applications. So in this, uh, this, in this page, we propose an end-to-end -end AI solutions and architecture. Uh, we, 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 you, can eat, uh, you can see in this site. And client can upload, at the beginning, client can upload an image, input image from the front-end portal. Uh, just the you can see in the left and upper side, and it will be passed to our three AI modules that we decide include the color tagging scoring AI model. And about the model training, we train our model on the Ali Cloud and explore our models uh, parameter in uh, include to the edge file and job lead files. And finally, we deploy model uh, by the flask on the uh, backend side. So you can see the, the overall big uh, architecture in this patch. So uh, we can move to the next page. Yeah, so for in this page, and uh, after we already know the project background and the architecture, we can dive into the module one, uh, which is the color analyst. And uh, color analyst is uh, to want to help analyze the color and extract the color from the pictures and for our designer. So uh, at the first, we can compare our solution to uh, other color extractions uh, website. And you can see in here the middle of the uh, the right hand side, and uh, you can see most of the uh, software or website they only can extract the black, gray, and white color for the main colors. But uh, compared to our model, we can concisely extract. Uh, you can see is our uh, upper upper side. You can see uh, our model can concisely extract the three different uh, dominant colors and three secondary colors and one accent colors. So uh, we can extract uh, more color, more color instead of only just different level of gray and um, and black. So our module is more uh, surface uh, ticket and enable to identify more detail of the color. And our act, uh, our client is very satisfied uh, with the performance of this model. So this is uh, this is uh, the demo, and uh, the next page. So uh, just like I mentioned, the model uh, performance uh, actually is very great. So how can we deal it? And in this module, we leverage the clustering model and add it on a very complex logic based on a book. Uh, which is principle of color designs. So uh, you can see the, the stage one, uh, we did a data processing on image, include uh, resize the image and transform the color to the grid. And stage two, uh, we clustering the image and split the pixel into the 15 groups. And then uh, stage three, we're going to uh, start our complex uh, logic include the, uh, the, right, uh, the button, button right uh, hand side is the main sub and color uh, logic, which for extracting the dominant and uh, secondary colors. So in this logic uh, map, we can uh, use, we, we use the uh, compare the uh, for example, uh, identify the light and dark area of uh, one image and try to find the com uh, complement uh, color pair and so on. It's a very complex uh, logic map. 
and others uh, uh, complex uh, accent uh, color logic is uh, used to identify the color object uh, with areas more than 5%, and the color is bright or not, and background is dark, and so on. So, uh, so far, this is the introduction of our color analyst uh, module, and then we are going to tagging, tagging module. Yeah, so uh, you can see in here, and, and you already uh, learned from the Richards. Uh, he mentioned about the YOLO V3 and object detections uh, on the part. So uh, in our module two, actually is our tagging uh, model. We build this application based on the YOLO V3 and download the web from the official website and some of you uh, may know YOLO V3 can detect the uh, AT object uh, classics uh, for this model. And we based on and communicate with our clients. And based on the client's opinion, we combine these AT classes to 20 categories. So we can see the, uh, the 20 category on the next page. Yeah. So, so for example, uh, if the, uh, the consumer uh, lay or uh, lay upload the image on our portal, and we will uh, try to identify what kinds of the objects uh, of in this uh, image, and then we will group, uh, for example, sofa, chair, tables uh, into a group as a furniture. Or we will, uh, if we see the fork, spoons, cup, and so on, into the table wares. So uh, uh, this is the, the module two tagging model. And the next page is about the scoring model. So this one is uh, uh, our final AI scoring model. Um, which is how we evaluate the picture's quality and uh, which means the picture is good or not or beautiful or not. And we separate the score to the uh, four level, including the uh, excellent, uh, good, or planned and need to be improved. And uh, in the subjective view, as a uh, humankind, uh, we will have our own opinion on the pictures. You may give the picture a score to describe to uh, it is beautiful or not. And everyone, I think everyone uh, may have their own answers uh, very different. And this, uh, this score maybe depends on your uh, personal uh, experience. So, uh, however, uh, in the objective view to distinguish the picture, whether the beautiful or not, can be dependent on the color theory or compositions of image and light balance and so on. So, uh, fortunately, and they could be transformed to digits. So, uh, how can we train our AI model to understand the quality of the image? This is the question. So uh, we introduced the Inception uh, V3 to learn this task. So the next page is uh, our, our uh, scoring model. And so uh, just like uh, the AI's Android says, uh, when we have a, a relative small data set, a super effective techniques is to use the transfer learnings where we use a pre-trained model. So uh, because we only have uh, around the uh, 3,000 3, image uh, in this project, and help is uh, positive and help is neg negative. So we prefer to use the transfer learning in this project. And we leverage the Inception V3 framework and freeze all of the earlier layers web and uh, train the softmax layers and train the model on our, on, based on our new data. And uh, we use the binary cross entropy as the, uh, as the loss matrix, as we have two categories uh, target, uh, which is the image is good or, good or not. So the final, the output score is in the range of the zero to one, and we will separate this zero to one score to 
to the to to the four level. And finally, we got the accuracy is around uh, 80% on our test data. So this is uh, uh, our uh, scoring model and using by the Inception Vsign framework. And the next page, is, the last part is uh, how our solution empower uh, the business in the future. And we, you may already know our, our three module uh about i think uh, about the scoring model is very interest uh feature because uh it provides the interactions uh and increase the in, in interaction with the uh, end users and the color model is a good uh, ai designer uh, assistant to empower designer to uh accelerate the color designs so uh and furthermore i think uh, we think the uh, tagging model and color model can be connect with the uh, intelligent recommendation function for example uh, if a consumer upload a picture uh, with a table and we can recommend a more relevant uh, relevant uh, table or product uh, for she or he may like and uh, this uh, application can drive more sales and improve the uh, consumer's uh, experience. So let's uh, bring me to the end of this talk and uh, many things of uh, your attention. Uh, this work is, uh, is an amazing one. So. Um, at the first beginning, we share a lot of uh, computer vision, for example, to uh, do the facial recognition, to uh, increase the productivity, to reduce cost. But now we also apply the computer vision in the designer, uh, the design domain. So it's a very uh, innovative application. Thank you. So now we are going to the our uh, last session is a Q&A and discussion. So uh, please uh, feel free to uh, ask your questions and also we, we, we are happy to uh, further discuss. Hello, hi, um, thanks for sharing. Uh, these are actually very interesting applications of uh, the uh, uh, computer vision, uh, especially in the uh, interior design. Uh, so, um, as what JY mentioned, uh, please feel free to drop your uh, questions if there are any. So, we'll wait for a couple of minutes. Uh, if not, then we can start to wrap up the session. So, actually, I think I do have a question regarding the uh, yeah the, the interior design part, right? So, at first, I was actually quite uh, amazed at how the model was able to distinguish between what's a primary color and a secondary color just from the image itself. And then when you got to the slide, I figured, oh, actually, there's a very complex uh, business logic behind it. So am I right to say that actually most of the, the heavy lifting of trying to classify the primary and secondary colors actually would be on, primarily on the, on the business logic, on actually the color knowledge? Yeah, uh, based on our previous experience, uh, just like I mentioned, uh, actually we do some research on the websites. Uh, there's a lot of uh, color extractions uh, website or software. And just like I mentioned, the, the, I think the model performance is very bad. Yeah, compared to our. And uh, we think the, the, the main idea is maybe they, they only use the cost ring or gaming or some cost rings model to, to deal with this problem, but they lack of the, some business logic after the model. So this is why we study a book. <laughs> we refer, we refer uh, the textbook actually is principle of the color colors and reading lots of uh, business logic in this domain and we build this uh, very complex logic we use uh, spend a lot of time in this uh, logic so finally uh, it's, it's very great to have a very great uh, performance in this color model and this uh, also uh, our clients is very uh, surprised because compared to the other website we get a very great accuracy yeah. okay 
techniques. So how long did you take to translate all that knowledge from the book into uh, the, the, the production? <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, I think uh, uh, because this project took us around uh, two months, and uh, at the first month we we tried to do the formal traditional uh, uh, classroom model came in or so on, and but we find the performance is uh, is not very good. So we, we at the first uh, month of uh, the end of this first month we start uh, start to read the book. <laughs> And I think uh, we we book uh, we book the book uh, online and uh, just uh, I remember have at least one textbook and reading it spend a lot of time. So uh, uh, finally we we build this complex project uh, around the two weeks. I see. So I would say so. Actually, back uh, we have one relevant question. So someone asked like how long did the entire use case take? So I estimate based on what you said about three months. Yeah. Uh, normally, uh, normally, uh, we will use uh, uh, to build the, the these kinds of AI solution around uh, three months. But in that, this case, we only use the uh, two months. Uh, what's the reason? Because uh, uh, actually, it's based on the, the client's budget. They only can accept the, the two months. But uh, just like I mentioned, I think uh, the, there's there's a lot of model we. We, we won't need to uh, just build it from scratch. So we use the transport learnings and the inception V3 to do, and it will be uh, accelerate the whole process we, we do this kinds of module. And I think it's a very interesting uh, project because you can see we, we won't uh, build the, uh, the very deep learning model by ourselves uh, from the scratch, we also can just directly use others uh, pre-trained model to do some business innovations for our clients. So I think uh, this is uh, the, the value, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we have actually two more questions. So the first question is direct, uh, uh, both of them actually directed at uh, Dr. Richard Price. So maybe uh, JY, can you help me read these questions to uh, Richard since he's actually on the phone. Okay, so the question is uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Weilun. So is it necessary to use ED for the document classification user case? Richard, can you answer the question? Hello, Richard. Hello, can you hear me, JY? Yep, we can hear yes, you. Can hear you. Oh, you can so, hear me. Um, Yes, the the Euclidean distance. Uh, the, the, I think the question was: Is it essential to use the Euclidean dis Euclidean distances? And yes, they are the main features um, of the model. Um, this is these distances allow it to classify the, um, the different document types because document type, say uh, one, may have one distance between or you know, one set of distances and another document type has another set of distances. And these are the key differences that the technique is using to differentiate between different document types. So I, I think the answer is yeah, yes, it is essential. Yeah, also, uh, we will have another two questions. Can you see the question? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, and following on, funnily enough, um, we found the Euclidean distances to be very important. The results did drop a little bit when we uh, only used the Euclidean distances and took out the confidence scores. Um, but we found the best results were by having them both, uh, both in there. But the Euclidean distances are doing the heavy lifting. And the second question is the uh, yeah is second question is the confidence score from your low file as a uh, input to GBM. Uh, yeah, that that was what I was just saying just okay. now. The, the yeah. confidence. Okay. Are less so important, the next but still they are bad. Yeah. Yeah. So can you see the next question? Can we use the final layer of base as the embeddings and uh, uh, perform classification from there directly? 
Now, that's an interesting idea. We've never thought of that. So um, uh, that's I'll, I'll, I'll throw that one to the team and, uh, <laughs> and see. Yeah, we, that, that's, we haven't even thought of that, indeed. So not, yeah, yeah that, that may work. Yeah, thank you, Valen. And uh, one more question, uh, Richard. So are, are all four anchors required for the uh, for the form document classification? What happens if yeah. one or more anchors are uh, executed by marks made by form submitters? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. And um, we find it can still classify with only three wheels on the wagon, if that makes sense. Um, but uh, because we have hit that very scenario, anchors not on as not um, as too close to the edge of, of a document, because if a document is rotated, then you may lose part of one of the anchors, which means that it that it, it may not get detected. Um, but interestingly, when we've seen examples like that, we have seen it classify um, uh, documents correctly. Um, we've seen a bit of both, but overall, I would say it handles that scenario quite well. Um, two, two anchors and no. But uh, yeah, it can still work with three. We have tried with only three uh, anchors um, for the whole method, and the results did degrade. And, 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 but we don't want to go to five anchors. The results presumably would still improve, but with 98% accuracy, we feel we've, we've kind of, it, it's good enough, and we don't want to add extra imposition on people having to label a fifth label. Okay, so we have one last question. So that's actually not direct to any specific project. I guess any of you can take that. Um, so CV is growing fast. There are a lot of multimodal related research and applications. So can any of you share more insights on this and what kind of future trend will happen in this direction? Uh, maybe I can share some of my experience and then Richard, you, you can add on. Uh, so definitely uh, computer vision now, we, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, demand from the market. So one direction is about the um, consumer. So all we could say uh, human being, right, to do the facial recognition. This one can be used by the government do uh, a lot of uh, citizen services and also the surveillance, right? And also the emotion detection. However, for the consumer uh, part, we have some uh, thought and uh, some uh, uh, ethical AI concern, right? So about the uh, customer privacy. However, now uh, recently we, we have seen a lot of uh, applications of a computer vision in other dimension. For example, in the manufacturing, just now I share, right, uh, to do the predictive maintenance to do the quality assurance. So uh, based on our uh, observation, our research, the predictive maintenance using computer vision is the uh, most popular AI application in the manufacturing domain. So I think this one will uh, will widely applied in the uh, recent uh, uh, in the next few years uh, due to the industry 4.0. And also the other uh, dimension is the design. Uh, although we didn't do so much about the design uh, application using computer vision, however, uh, you see right the uh, for the uh, design platform using uh, uh, computer vision shared by. Uh, you. This one is a very innovative one. Also, when we talk to client, also they have some uh, um, uh, demand, for example, how to do the uh, design for the product package. So this one uh, for us uh, looks very simple, right? For example, uh, a milk uh, bottle or uh, our cosmetic bottle, right? But uh, for them, for the brand side, they do a lot of uh, uh, research and the customer survey to select the Final the select the best design. For example, for a new product launch, right? They may do uh, hundreds of design, and then they recruit a lot of uh, consumers to do the rating. So the process will take a long time, but. 
in this uh, in this uh, area, whether we can use a uh, uh, computer vision, right? For example, something similar like uh, uh, the one uh, Eve share with us, right? Do the AI scoring instead of using the uh, human rating. So this one may be another uh, uh, error. Richard, and you maybe I your 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 I on some of your comments. You certainly have from me, Eve. Um, would you like to go first? Uh, uh, okay. So uh, just uh, like uh, the JY mentioned, uh, I think in China, I received a uh, lot of uh, requirement from our clients is about a uh, for the manufacturing, and uh, they would like to use the image detection to identify the. Uh, machine will be broken or not, or what kinds of the uh, key parts is a failure or not, they can directly use the image to do the uh, predictive maintenance uh, in, in, in China. And I think uh, in China, BMW already did these kinds of the, uh, 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 pilots and uh, they have a, a many factories, uh, factory already did these kinds of applications. So this is my part. And, and uh, just like uh, Richard mentioned, uh, we also received a uh, lots of uh, OCRs uh, application in China because uh, there's a lots of uh, traditional uh, bank. They have the, uh, for example, the finance contract, and they would like to use the image detection to directly uh, extract uh, the man's uh, the man's uh, uh, idea or the man's uh, text uh, on the contracts. So it will be uh, to do to uh, saving the manpower uh, on their business process. Yeah, I, and I think the ladies have covered just about everything I can think of, but I just feel we're limited by our, we're only limited by our own imaginations in this space. You know, this this technology has just kind of emerged, and and uh, no matter which industry you speak to and who you speak to, they will find an application for it. Um, a, a lot of the ones that um, JY and, and Eve have, have mentioned, and um, uh, just various um, conversations I've had, largely around those those commercial um, problems or industrial problems. Um, one springs to mind for, as, as JY was saying about predictive maintenance, when, say, um, cell towers, which are very expensive to, um, to go and inspect, uh, drones can go up, take imagery, and we can detect problems in, in components um, without having to send expensive teams climbing up big towers in, in dangerous environments. Um, so, you know, in situations like that, no matter who you speak to, there'll be a different implication for this stuff. Uh, yeah, it, it's sort of virgin snow for a lot of us, you know, <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, thanks. So we actually have one, maybe we'll wrap up with one last question. Um, so could we basically um, elaborate a bit on how these solutions uh, have been scaled in the each of the respective organizations and were there any challenges uh, faced uh, in the process of doing so? Richard, I, maybe you'll share some of your, your experience uh, for the document processing? Yes. Um, certainly our client organization processes 20,000 documents a day. And so um, speed is of the essence. And uh, so that works out at about four seconds per document. And um, in fact, what we found was Detectron 2 was taking about three seconds a page to do the object detection. And, um, and that was, for some documents, too, too slow. And um, what we've had to do is um, consider um, YOLO because, uh, and, and swap to YOLO because YOLO is much, much quicker. It's just on CPU, um, it's down at around 0.1 of a second per page. To uh, So these are some of the real world issues. So sorry, the, the, what I should have explained is there are two environments that, are, that can be contemplated. One is in the online space. So literally as whilst customers are uploading and that's where speed has to be quick because you don't want to interfere with the customer experience. But if you're doing it in the offline, then 
uh, speed is less of a less of a concern. But so moving things into the online space, um, obviously computer vision is quite resource and compute intensive, and we've had to um, to think of ways to to get around that. And YOLO is is would be our advice if you want if you need speed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you have anything to add on, if you want? Maybe I just uh, uh, share some uh, general uh, general uh, experience, right? So when we do the uh, scaling AI, right, the deployment of uh, AI at scale, so uh, we observe our client are uh, facing some uh, common challenges. So the first one. Is uh, they are they are maybe they are missing the skill set in the organization Be because this one is uh, not a data scientist work, not a, the the data engineer work. Actually, we need to hire a uh, uh, machine learning engineer to set up the ML ops uh, pipeline, also to uh, do the production. Also, after that, we need to uh, have a uh, have a framework to do the uh, monitoring and the enhancement. This one is very, very important uh, for the AI application, but uh, we, we found uh, this this type always uh, be, uh, be, be uh, missed by the uh, organization and the developer. So um, definitely uh, for the uh, skill part, we also need some uh, uh, the business adoption, right? We need to have the um, uh, data literacy, AI literacy across the organization is not only for the data scientist, data team, right, or AI team. So need the business stakeholder to buy in your, your application. And uh, maybe the other part is about the uh, AI ethics. So this one, we need to make sure our uh, model uh, is fair, is, uh, uh, can be explained, also is uh, we can protect the data and the customer privacy. So with all these elements, we can uh, have a, a big scale uh, AI deployment. I think that, yeah, uh, that pretty uh, is, a, is a very good summary of uh, general mm -hmm. adoption of any AI solutions in, in any industry. So we have come to the end of the session. So I would like to thank uh, Eve, Richard and Xingyun from uh, CapGenai to, to share uh, their, their projects and as well as for answering all the, the questions that we posted. And of course, I want to thank uh, our, our um, community for attending the event. And last but not least, uh, Justin from Google uh, Developer Space for helping to support this event. So thanks everyone and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.